Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is Newport City Police Chief Paul Duquette. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. So, uh, pretty soon we're not going to be seeing your face patrolling the streets of Newport. What are you, retiring? I am. August 1st, I'm all done. How do you feel about that? Kind of mixed emotions. You know, uh, there was an old cop in Newport, Ray Carpenter, right. a railroad cop, and he said, uh, you'll know when it's time to retire. Right. And he was right. So, uh, you know, there's other things I want to do, and in July I'll be hitting 35 years. Mm. So it's, uh, it's time. And, and you're not that old of a fella. Um, like, I think of another lawman who I have a feeling you knew very well and probably had a lot of respect for is uh, Norman Morrow. Oh, yeah. When Norman retired as a game warden, Everybody predicted his demise because, like, why would a man in his condition at the top of his game retire? Well, it's, it had to be because he was dying. But no, Norman said he wanted to retire at the top of his game because he said too many people, whether it's in law enforcement or other professions, they wait until they start going downhill and they're not remembered when they're at the top of their game. Yeah, that's true. You're not dying of cancer or anything, are you? Not that I know of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Arthritis is a problem, but... So, in previous interviews with you in the past, throughout the years, you've told me you were not destined to be a lawman when you were younger. No, not really. Probably, if you ask some of my old teachers, they probably would have thought I'd gone on the other <laughs> side of the fence. Well, do you think it... You know, there's a saying, it takes a crook to know a crook. Well, I'm not saying you were a crook, but because you were a bit of a wild child at times, do you think it, do you think it made you a better lawman? I think so. It, uh, it gave me a realization of, uh, you know, the thought process of somebody that, you know, might bend the law or something every now and then. Right. Now, tell the, the viewers, how did you come about being on the Newport City Police Department? Well, basically, uh, I was in between jobs. I'd just gotten married, and uh, we saw an ad in the paper that Newport City Police was looking for two <laughs> officers, and that was in 1977. I went and took the written test, passed that, and I guess the rest is kind of history. I ended up getting hired. So, but when you applied, you really didn't envision yourself someday leading the department. No. No, I didn't. I, I was kind of surprised that I passed the test. I mean, I was an honor student in school, but didn't know anything about law enforcement. So when you started in law enforcement, compared to today, is anything different? Night and day. Night and day. Night like, and day. Give me some examples. Well, when I first started, I, I worked 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., mm -hmm. and my job was walking along Main Street, East Main Street, the causeway, rattling doors you know, talking to people, mm. kind of uh, community policing before community p policing became a catchphrase. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, today it's just high-tech, whiz-bang, Y-generation mm -hmm. stuff, you know. it's. But do you think there's enough of that, that walk in the street and rattling the doors? Because, to me, you know, those interactions you have with people, particularly the people that some people might view as undesirables, if you strike up a conversation with them, sometimes they, they probably just spill the beans about different things. Oh, absolutely. That was, uh, that was some of the funnest times of my career when I first started because I learned that talking to people and having them see my face and back then bumming cigarettes off me and stuff, <laughs> you know, I got a lot of information. Now, you must have worked underneath John Vinan at one time. I did. Because John Vinan, when he retired, I interviewed him, and John was saying there was one reason, particularly, that he was a talker versus a fighter. He said he couldn't beat his way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> so, but he said that, that really worked well for him. Uh, do you find that sometimes words can really... Either, well, either escalate a problem oh, or de-escalate. Well, you're talking about John Vining. There's an individual who used words to, to work his way out of any situation. Right. 
I also worked under Jim Moulton, one of the other, other sergeants, and many times I'd have the situation kind of resolved. He'd walk in the door and it'd just escalate right back up because we used to call him our, our PR man, Mr. Personality. <laughs> so, uh, you know, personality comes into play a lot. Right. Do, do you see your officers as any different, like the ones who you began with versus the ones you see coming out of the academy now? Yeah. This, this younger generation isn't as people-oriented as, right. as when I started. But is that, is that their fault, or is that the people that, that the academy's looking for? Because, um, you know, I look at, you know, I, I know there are a lot of fine officers today. I do know that. But, you know, this, this whole military look, this whole, you know, cropped hair... Uh, you know, I, I think it kind of goes against community policing. Yeah, it does. Because, you know, you have somebody show up with uh, with cropped hair and wearing the black leather gloves and mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know, it uh, they automatically, they're on their defensive side, you know, and, and uh, it's not like the early days, you know, the John Vinings and when I was walking shift. Mm -hmm. But, you know, gone are the days, because I know back... You know, John talked about when he became an officer, and probably when you became an officer, if you pulled over somebody, say a respected member of the community who uh, shouldn't be behind the wheel of a car, you could just say, hey, come with me, and I'll bring you home. But John said those days are pretty much done. Yeah, yeah, I can remember. Uh, you know, I didn't give any preference to respected members, but if, if somebody treated me well... Mm. Sometimes I'd give them a break, bring them home. You know, they, they'd never be allowed to drive away, but I might bring them home. Mm. But, uh, you know, what happened was uh, people took advantage of that, and you'd bring them home, and then they weren't quite done drinking or whatever the night, so they'd jump in another car and head right back out again. Or the, the other thing they'd probably do is they'd probably go tell all their friends. Yeah. So if you pulled over one of their friends, they'd say, hey, wait a minute. You gave Joe a ride home yeah, the other night. Him, um, what are some of your most memorable moments on the department? Uh, I think it was 2001. Pasumsic Bank on East Main Street got robbed. And, a short, and at that particular time, uh, I was in Florida on vacation. And uh, I got the phone call that they got robbed. And I said, well, I'm not coming home, but we'll work <laughs> on it when I get back. And when I got back... The Main Street branch got robbed, mm -hmm. and uh, to make a long story short, we ended up catching the individual that was responsible for both of them. Right, and uh, he was uh, quite a character because he was from Connecticut. He faced charges on our two bank robberies, ended up being held by the feds because the FBI got involved mm -hmm. at the Grand Isle County Jail. He overpowered a deputy, <laughs> stole a car, <laughs> went back down to Connecticut, robbed a bank down there, and then got arrested. And uh, to my knowledge, he's still doing time. Is, isn't that the fella who he thought he got away further enough from the bank on Main Street, but then he ran over to the pick and shovel where he would had his car or something? That's when he took off his mask. He ran through the pick and shovel right. parking lot there. He, he, he didn't have a mask, but he had a hood right. sealed right up tight with sunglasses and stuff, and he pulled it all down and everything. Now, I often joke with all these cameras around today, you know, whether it's on businesses, homes, or just the community, isn't it harder to get away with committing a crime? It is, but one of the, uh, one of the articles of clothing that has caused most problems to us is the hooded sweatshirt. Mm. I mean, you had the uh, backwards bandit there right. that was wearing them backwards with uh, eye holes cut out. Mm. But just if you look at the recent bank robberies, armed robberies and all that, probably 80% of them are wearing a hooded sweatshirt sealed right up with either a mask or sunglasses <laughs> or whatever. Huh. Have you seen more robberies in recent years because probably directly related to the uh, drug epidemic? Knock on wood, not so much in Newport, but if you look throughout the country, mm -hmm. there's been a lot, and a lot of it is driven by the need for prescription drugs. Mm. Do you think enough is being done to curtail that? No. What do you think needs to be done? Well, there has to be a cooperative effort 
between hospitals, doctors, pharmacists, law enforcement, and educators. Mm -hmm. And you have the hospitals and the doctors that are governed by HIPAA regulations mm -hmm. that make it tough to release information. You know, they've basically been told if you don't say anything, you'll never get in trouble. Right. Then you've got the legislature that are afraid that police are going on a fishing expedition mm -hmm. and they're, they've extremely limited the access to the prescription registry, which would cut down a lot of travel time because prescription drugs are probably the most difficult drug cases to work. Mm -hmm. Because if I stop you and you've got a bottle of OxyContin in your pocket, I've been told you're selling them, but mm -hmm. you have a prescription for them, there's nothing I can do. Hmm. What I have to end up doing is getting an informant or you to sell me the pills, mm -hmm. and then we can charge you. You know what I have found? Because I actually know a couple people very well who they got involved with prescription drugs, but they did it basically legally mm -hmm. originally because one of them broke his leg, yep. and he had no intention. Like, this is not somebody you would even know who he is. And this isn't somebody that you would have thought would have gone from having a broken leg to understanding the system yep. of how you buy drugs off the street. Now he's totally, he's totally recovered. But he, he often jokes about how, yep. how he went from, in a six-month period, went from an upstanding human being to breaking his leg to understanding the whole system. Yep. We see that often. A lot of times it's... Uh is somebody that got hooked on pain medication from an injury and then they go to buying the medication off the street because you can only get so much from doctors right. and then they come into a, a lack of money and stuff so oftentimes they look at heroin because heroin in the city is so cheap right. and, and what I found interesting I was just talking to somebody else who who has beat it but they were saying even buprenorphine mm -hmm. buprenorphine to the viewers Basically, it's a drug that helps you, it helps reduce the craving for drugs. For narcotics. For narcotics. But even that is a cash commodity. Absolutely. That's the, probably one of the, it might be the most abused drug right now. Right. Because what they do is if they, they, will, they will get it legally. Mm-hmm. And then they'll sell it because, you know, there's a lot of prescription drug addicts who have no interest in being on drugs. They want off. And so they take advantage of that. And I think it's like $15 a pill, something like that. Lots of times. I mean, it's even more so in the, in the prisons. Uh, the buprenorphine, one of them you're talking about is Suboxone. Mm -hmm. And it's a little orange stop sign shaped pill. Mm -hmm. And for a while, if you could get them inside the facilities, they were selling for $160 a tablet. That's, that's the reduce their craving. Yeah, that's, right. that's a, it's a narcotic substitute. It, you know, it reduces the craving, the, the psychological craving and the physical craving for the narcotics. So then the pharmaceutical company said, okay, that's being abused so much, now we'll come up with the strips. Well, now the strips are being abused also. Right. Now what about, uh, I was talking to a person who said, Oxycontin is, they've started something where it's harder now. Yeah, Oxycontin has had a uh, time release element built right. in. And if you crushed them, it defeated the time release element. Right. And then they used to snort them, shoot them, whatever. And now the pharmaceutical companies from pressure from law enforcement and doctors and hospitals have put in a different type of uh, agent that makes them more difficult to abuse. Right, because uh, the person was telling me, that was one of the best things they did uh, because that's really put a crimp on. It's, it's decreased it, but what's happened was the big money used to be made on the OxyContin 80 milligram pills. Mm -hmm. Well, now the pharmaceutical companies have 40s, 30s, 20s, and 10s, and mm -hmm. what you've seen is the price of those has doubled mm -hmm. out on the street. Okay, go back to the 1970s. What kind of drugs were you seeing back then? Back then, marijuana, uh, an occasional uh, person with LSD. Of course, you had, you know, still the flower children mm -hmm. cruising around the country. Some cocaine. Uh, didn't seem to be a lot of, uh, a lot of pharmaceutical abuse. Mm -hmm. 
every now and then heroin, but heroin back then was a real dirty, you know, mm -hmm. disgusting practice. So there's been a lot of talk lately about legalizing or decriminalizing marijuana, and then they, there's also talk, or have we done it yet? Do we, do we now dispense marijuana? We don't have any dispensaries open, but we have medical marijuana users who have, a, have the ability to possess certain amounts of marijuana for their medicinal purposes. Mm. But uh, dispensaries are on the horizon here very soon, and there's a big push for de decriminalization. Uh, started last year and is continuing this year. So what do you think about that? I'm against it because the DEA still classifies marijuana as a, you know, a, a Schedule One substance. Right. You know, um, I could go either. I personally could go either way on it, but I, I think the one thing that keeps a lot of people from from using it or at least abusing it is the knowledge that it is illegal. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I think the number of people using it will increase. Yep. Other states' records have shown that. You know, uh, I think one state, they went from 1,600 medical marijuana card holders to 16,000 in the first year that they opened dispensaries. Well, you know, you know what I find kind of ironic is our society now is virtually turning cigarette smokers into criminals, you know, where they almost have to just hide in an alley to have a cigarette. But at the same time, we're trying to decriminalize marijuana. Mm -hmm. So I, I just find, I just, I find that kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a weird situation. You know, the reason, one of the reasons I'm so against marijuana, and you know, I, I'll throw it out there, a gateway drug. I don't believe it's a gateway drug, but what we see is people that are dealing marijuana are also dealing pills, mm -hmm. are also dealing heroin. So, you know, it's a one-stop shop now, where mm -hmm. before people didn't really cross over the different stuff. Right. And you don't go out, like lawmen today, like you hear about people being thrown in jail for a year for having a joint. You know, you don't go out of your way for somebody sitting in their living room having a joint, do you? No, and I think you'll find the people that are in jail for possession of marijuana, if you look, dig a little deeper, you're mm -hmm. going to find that they've violated probation, you know, 10 times or something for a more serious crime, and that's just the final thing they got caught with or whatever. Right. I think it's a, uh, it's a fallacy that uh, our jails are full of marijuana smokers. You know, Paul, the, the one story you've heard many times... But I always found it funny, is your uncle, <laughs> Anatole Duquette, I used him in my book, Rum Runners and Revenuers, Prohibition in Vermont, and he was so proud of you, uh, being, but he was proud of you because it, it was proof that the Duquettes were not outlaws. <laughs> uh, as you know, your, your uncle had this crooked oh, yeah. finger and when he was making a point he would um, but he remembered to that his dying day the exact rest the exact family recipe to make moonshine during <laughs> prohibition yeah. and and I guess it was your grandfather right who yep. liked to start the day off with a nip of moonshine oh yeah but, every, every morning he had two fingers of moonshine right. supposedly and uh, and Anatol wanted to make sure people understood that they were not outlaws. This was a French Canadian tradition, and they just and they didn't sell it. But he wanted people to understand that that the Duquettes were honorable people because their nep uh, his nephew was the Newport City police chief. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, uh, have you ever tried your uncle's uh, nope. moonshine recipe? No, I never did. I didn't know about it till. Uh Probably I wrote about it. No, it was just before that, actually, because uh, we were talking about stuff, and he put up his finger there, and it, <laughs> it kind of bent this way, you know. And he says, you know, he says, your grandfather used to start every day with a little nip. Right. He says he had arthritis and diabetes, and it got him going. <laughs> um, yeah, because I even remember how he made it. They made it in a, uh, they made it in a big uh, milk can, yeah. and... Anatol's job was, well, they'd make it, and it was just, you know, 
it wasn't a lot, but he, they'd keep it in his bedroom next to the chimney, which put off heat, and it would uh, ferment. Yep. And every morning and every night, he would stir, stir it. it up. Yep. And um, then, then they would, uh, then they would heat it and strain it and everything. And he said, uh, he he told me, you know, if you if you did went through the process once, it would be, oh, let's just say fifty percent, and then you do it again, you get a hundred percent. So you know, we've talked a lot about drugs, but what about what about alcohol? You've seen the ravages of alcohol on the street, haven't you? Oh yeah, it's uh, it, it's uh, an, an evil because so many people nowadays, you know, today's society is so high pressure, mm-hmm. and they look for outlets, mm-hmm. and you know, alcohol's one of them, drugs is another, and it's you know, it's often leads to bigger and worser things. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you from my perspective as a non-law man, I still think, though, when it comes to drinking and driving, people have gotten it finally, Par- partly because of you guys, partly because of people dying. Like, I think there was a big defining point in this area uh, because of the laws, but because I think people learned from it when the four young people died yeah. on the interstate. Um, I think today's young people particularly get it much more than our generation. Yes and no. I mean, they do, and I th- I'm hoping that, like, I had a part in that because we used that accident from the Four Lake Region kids hmm. to go to North Country, and we talked to every driver's ed class. Hmm. We've been doing it now for about nine or ten years. Hmm. And finally... We're allowed to do it and talk about it at Lake Region. So I think and I hope that we made some kind of, uh, you know, difference in in Mm. young people drinking and driving. Uh, You know, there the legislature's help because they they, uh, changed the possession laws for alcohol, made it easier to to process somebody. Now it's just a civil ticket. So and you give a kid a chance, you know, you catch them drinking or in possession. You give them, him or her, a ticket, and if they complete a diversion program, they have a clean slate. Mm. So it gives them a little impetus to, to go get counseling, have an assessment, and, you know, maybe learn and avoid a, a, a serious incident like that. Well, you probably, you know, there, there was one incident though, incident, though, where, boy, it just didn't seem right. And I know you're probably familiar with the incident, is where the uh, young man was home on leave from Iraq, uh, he was in a combat situation, and he was the vehicle was pulled over. Actually, it was during the fish festival when it was, you know, free drugs and everything out yeah. there. But he was unfortunate enough to be picked up out in, uh, I believe, North Troy by game wardens who were operating that week as regular patrol people. Yep. And he was in the back seat. Nobody else in the vehicle was drinking. He had the equivalent of one beer in his system. He was like 19 or 20, and he was ticketed for underage drinking. And, oh, you know, that, that's a hard one. It is. I mean, there again, discretion. Right. You know, you, you use discretion sometimes. Mm-hmm. Not all the time. Sometimes you're in a position, and today being, you know, the society being so litigious, you can get sued for anything. Oh yeah. So you have to really cover your butt these days, but there's still some discretion you can use. Mm. You know, I had an incident. Uh, we were working a DUI detail, and uh, I was on Route 16 between Glover and Barton, and met a car that was speeding. So I turned around. Well, he tried to hide on me, and uh, I found him, and he was 20 years, 11 months, and like 21 days. And he gave me a hard time. Mm. So I said, well, too bad for you. He was, I gave him the ticket for operating with, uh, with alcohol in his system and for underage drinking. You know, if he had been a little bit uh, more reasonable, mm. hadn't tried to ditch me, I, you know, might not have been so severe on him. But, you know, a, as a cop, my philosophy has always been, you know, treat me as you like to be treated. Okay. And so I have never, I, I have never had a speeding ticket and to tell you the truth is I've been pulled over a couple times for things that I didn't uh, even uh, 
no, I had wrong. Like, you know, the headlight out. You know, I didn't know I had a headlight out. Yep. But poor, you know, by the time the poor officer was done with me, I usually had a customer, <laughs> and he was usually really sick of me, and he had a bundle of Northland journals to go along. Go <laughs> oh, all. so you're bribing officers uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, have, uh, I have never had a speeding ticket, and people say to me, but how do you not have a speeding ticket? I said, yeah, there's a secret. Don't speed. Yeah. No, no, we all speed. Yeah. But the thing is, is I really try not to. Um, but it's it's funny how you officers can have us conditioned too. I got pulled over back a couple years ago on the interstate in New Hampshire. I knew I weren't speeding because I had it set right on cruise control, and my uh, uh, my GPS tells me when I'm speeding. Mm-hmm. So I knew I weren't speeding, and. Um, all of a sudden, up in front of me, there was two officers, and they were just pointing to us, uh, you know, because they, they'd had a radar up earlier, must be. Yep. And the officer comes over and says to me, license and registration, I gave it to him, and uh, didn't even think about it. Then he comes back, he says, I'm just giving you a warning. And then it finally dawned on me. I said, can you tell me what am I getting a warning for? He's speeding. Because he, he pulled over the car in front of me, too. And good judgment prevailed that time. I was getting a warning. <laughs> but I really wanted to say, sorry, buddy, I was not speeding. Uh, but I know what happened, I believe. And tell me if this could have happened. The person who, who he pulled over first in front of me he had just been like past me. Mm-hmm. Could, could his radar have gotten screwed up because I weren't speeding? Possibly. I mean, with radar, radar's you know, it's, it's a wide beam, right. and it picks up, you know, the fastest object. And if, you, if the officer looks up and sees two vehicles side by side, they're saying, well, you know, they're going the same speed. Lasers are much better, right. much more accurate. Yeah. But, uh, so did I do the right thing? Not argue with the oh, guy. Absolutely. Who's <laughs> absolutely. So, because there's a, there's a state trooper in the area that says, uh, you know, I have the power of the pen. And if somebody starts getting a little vocal or obstinate or downright ugly, you know, lots of times we can just keep writing tickets. So, so what is the worst thing? If, if you're just being picked up for speeding, what's the worst thing you can say to an officer? <laughs> the, the easiest thing to do is just ask for an explanation and then just shut your mouth. Right. You know, you can always contest it in court. How about if you, does it help at all? Like, I've often said honesty in life is the best policy. Yep. If I, if you come up to the car, you now unlike last time where, now that time where I wasn't speeding, uh, but if, if, I, if I knew I was speeding, say, yep, I know why I'm being pulled over. I was speeding, and I have no excuse for it. Does that honesty get you any place? It might. There again, you know, the officer has discretion. Right. So, uh, do you ever do you do you ever give breaks? Oh yeah. Mm. Yep. Unfortunately, one of the evils of uh, law enforcement is you need informants to start drug cases. Lots of times. Right. And uh, I've had a standing policy with the, uh, well, with the state's attorneys ever since I've been chief that I'm kind of allowed to, uh, to bargain with different cases mm-hmm. so that we can try to get people for uh, drug investigations or burglary investigations, you know, serious crime. So, so if you guys pull my wife over again, which hasn't happened in a few years, <laughs> uh, she's, she's uh, lightened her foot up on the pedal. If, if she'd been able to sing the right song, she would have been able to get out of a ticket. Well, usually we don't do it for speeding tickets. It's like, uh, you know, the more serious things, driving license suspended or some larceny stuff, you know, if, if there isn't a, an identifiable victim or, you know. Okay. Um, you've also led a very different life, at least a part of it, than many other officers have in the area. You once worked undercover. Yep. And now let's show the viewers what you once looked like. Now tell us about this picture. 
Well, it was probably back in uh, oh, 88, 89. Mm -hmm. I'd uh, become one of the first municipal officers selected to be part of the new Vermont Drug Task Force. Mm -hmm. Prior to the task force, drug investigations usually fell on individual departments or the state SIU unit. And Vermont, you know, was getting uh, a lot of cocaine cases, a lot of marijuana smuggling, stuff like that. So the federal government made funding available for these drug task force. Mm -hmm. And the state police were going to run it, but they knew they had to get officers from different parts of the state that knew the areas, knew the people, and actually gave more money or brought in more money in the, in the drug grants. So uh, it was in April of 88 I became uh, a member of the Vermont Drug Task Force. <laughs> Yeah, I know I interviewed you uh, about your time, in it, and you actually had some, well, hair-raising stories, but some humorous stories. Let's start off with the humorous one about the time that you were pulled over by an officer without any ID on you. <laughs> and you looked like this. <laughs> yeah, I had long hair, a beard. <laughs> I was driving one of the other guy's car, and it had a New Hampshire plate on it. And we were doing a surveillance uh, we'd convince the hierarchy in <laughs> Vermont that uh, if we could identify a source of like heroin or cocaine mm -hmm. out of state, we should try to work with that state to, to bring about an arrest of them. So we're going through Manchester, New Hampshire on Interstate 93, and we're following an informant and a couple of guys down to Massachusetts to get a load of heroin. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I look in my rearview mirror and there's a New Hampshire state <laughs> trooper, and he's pulling me over. So I pull over, I hollered on the radio, I said, hey, I'm getting stopped, keep going, I'll catch up. <laughs> so the trooper comes up and he says, uh, good afternoon, sir. He says, uh, do you by any chance know that your license plate expired nine years ago? <laughs> I said, well, no, I didn't. And he says, uh, you got license and registration? I said, yeah, I do. Registration is uh, in the glove box. And he says, well, let me see your license. So I hand him my license. <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, where are you going? I said, well, you see that car right there going out of sight? I says, I'm a cop in Vermont. We're following that car down the, I think it was Lawrence, Massachusetts, <laughs> to get a load of heroin. And he kind of took a step back, and he <laughs> says, heroin, huh? I said, yeah, remember I said I'm a cop. He says, well, you got any ID? I said, no, <laughs> this isn't my car. My car is back in Vermont because it's well known by the, the people that were in the car. Well, you got anything that shows you're a cop? I said, well, I got a radio and a gun. <laughs> then he, he started laughing. He says, well, that story must be true. He says, go ahead. He says, get a different plate. Um, now, on the flip side, what was, what was one of your worst stories where you thought, geez, my, my time on this earth might be over with? Well, I was doing an undercover in Barrie, and, uh, you know, there was kind of a network of people that were, you know, multi-ounce level cocaine dealers mm -hmm. and cocaine users, so they were always paranoid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was buying from this one guy, and I'd ordered up, I think it was two ounces. So I'd go in the house, and he was really paranoid that day. And uh, he says, uh, I, you know, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. He says, I'm going to search you for a wire. <laughs> of course, I had a wire, but I had it kind of hidden away, and I kept that part of my body away from him. But the guy was probably pretty close to my size and, you know, paranoid and always coked up. So I had a old undercover gun in my pocket, and he found my gun. <laughs> so he says to me, he says, are you a cop? Why are you carrying a gun? And I said, well, because I deal with bleep like you. And uh, he says, oh, okay. It appeased him there, but... For a second there, I thought I was going to have to throw out the old uh, red flag and call for the troops to come in or else knock the guy on his butt or whatever. And to be realistic, I think you said that when you're out on the street, your, your back, you know, when you're a patrol officer in Orleans County, your backup might be a long ways away. But as an undercover person, weren't pretty much they your back up right there if something went bad yeah you, you know we we had a good unit because it was the first drug unit or first drug task force and they tried to pick you know some some good working 
police officers. And we, uh, we became a real bonded, you know, cohesive group and we're really worried about each other's back. And we had uh, electronic equipment that we used, which wasn't always the best. And, but there was always teams nearby and we always had these catchphrases that if you thought things were going south, you could say it and, you know, the troops would come running in. Didn't you once run into somebody who recognized, thought they recognized you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was talking about alcohol use. <laughs> yeah, I was invited, invited to a wedding that was supposed to have a lot of uh, uh, drug people at it. Yeah. So I'm down there and sipping on a beer and making the rounds and... This girl comes up to me and she says, aren't you Paul Duquette? <laughs> Didn't we go to high school together? I said, no, that weren't me. She says, well, what's your name? So I gave her my cover name, you know. And she said, nah. Of course, she was, she was probably like a 1.5 or something, you know, yeah. alcohol content. And uh, after I bought her a drink and everything, I'd convinced her that I wasn't Paul Duquette and <laughs> ended up buying a gram of Coke off a guy and starting a friendship with him, you know, for, for drugs. You know, you know what I remember is uh, you and your wife were at our house for, I, I remember we had a party for something, and it was when you, were, when you were in full beard and full hair, and uh, I, I just remember a couple people saying that, boy, you'd gone to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what had happened to him? Yeah. But you must have had some people who, you know, I'm sure your friends understood what you were doing in your family, but you must have had people that you saw infrequently thought maybe you'd gone over the edge a little bit. Oh, yeah. They, uh, they asked a lot of questions, and, you know, I'd hear after the fact, they'd say, well, what happened to Duquette? He ain't a cop no more or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you weren't always long. You didn't always have a long hair long hair and a beard didn't you weren't you sometimes because you speak french weren't you a french businessman sometimes yeah yeah it changed your look i mean because you know the uh the communication network in the drug world is unbelievable mm. i mean they they had they got cops beat all to hell as far as communicating and letting know who has what and when the next load's coming in and all this stuff so you know if you drove around in a blue Thunderbird and had long hair and a beard, mm. it wasn't long before people would start looking for that car or watching out for that car. So, you know, you changed it up, swapped cars out, changed your look. Now, you had a wife and two kids. Mm -hmm. or you do have a wife and two kids. You know, your kids are grown now. But um, did you ever worry for them? Yeah, because, we, you know, we did some cases on some big players, and it was... Uh, it was it was a concern. Didn't you get a little reminder that what could happen? Didn't oh you? yeah, my my son. <laughs> this was kind of comical after the fact, but uh, I get home from work one day and my son hands me this envelope that he'd opened up that he'd gotten in the, that we'd gotten in the mail and it was addressed to me. And uh, I looked at the envelope and felt there was something heavy in it, so I looked in it and there was a nine millimeter bullet <laughs> with my name engraved on it, and. Uh, Dick Perry was a uh, detective with the state police down in St. Johnsbury, and of course we call state police to report it. And uh, he came up and got the envelope, and my son, who was about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11, had to get fingerprinted so we could uh, <laughs> do comparison prints and all that. And it was, uh, it was quite a, you know, my wife was worried about that. And now that son now is, in, is a Border Patrol agent? He is. Right. Then on the southern border? He did a year or so in uh, Calexico, California, mm. which is uh, extremely busy and extremely volatile, and okay. now he's in Montana. Right. So let's move up to 9-11. Now, you're the, you're the chief of police in Newport, which technically isn't a border community. It's, it's close to it. But did 9-11 did have a profound impact on oh, your department? 9-11 changed the world. I mean, before, you know, I was kind of chief of police in Newport, Vermont, and, you know, kind of had blinders on because, you know, the city council likes their chief to be involved in Newport City stuff. Right. Heaven forbid we go to Derby for anything. Hmm. But having been in the task force, I had all these relationships with the now hierarchy of the state police. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I kept abreast of what was happening in Vermont and stuff. Well, after 9-11... 
Now as a chief of Newport, Vermont, I had to be aware of what was happening on the border, what the terrorists were doing, and you know, it just changed everything. Do you think people, do you think we as in local, as in not you because you're, you're in the know, but do you think we fully understand all that goes on on the border that comes across? No, no. Bef- pre-9-11, we used to have these details that we'd work with Customs and Immigration at I-91 access, or I-91 port of entry. And it amazed me at the people that showed up there. I mean, you had, you had Russian nationals, you had uh, Chinese nationals, you had people from Colombia, and it, it just amazed me that they were coming through Derby Line, Vermont. And uh, of course now, after 9-11, we know that you know, the northern border is pretty porous and Montreal's a hotbed for all kinds of stuff and it's only 90 miles away so you gotta you gotta be aware of what's happening around you know um, I, I I've written a lot about the border over the years starting out with my uh, rum runners and revenuers but also I followed this whole operation stone garden mm-hmm. now I know a lot of people in law enforcement who will be who will who have said underneath their breaths, away from uh, any any uh, microphones or anything, is the way that whole stone garden came down was a bit of a debacle. Do you agree? I, I happen. I'm going to be quite upfront. I. I, I look at that and I would go up the Derby line and you'd swear. Probably a little exaggeration. There was more officers on the road than there were residents. But that, that just didn't seem to make a lot of sense the way that unfolded. Yes and no. I mean, I, I thought it got spread around a little bit too much because I, I wasn't really of the consensus that, you know, some of these outlying counties should be working in Derby Line. They didn't know the area, mm-hmm. and, you know, some of them were a little gung-ho, didn't have a lot of discretion and stuff. But the whole point of it was to focus on that there was three unguarded entries mm-hmm. into the United States and to put a, an emphasis in that area, which is along Caswell and mm-hmm. all the way up through to the interstate e- exchange, and the Border Patrol office in Newport was building up at that time, so it gave their officers uh, more of an opportunity to be out and about in the spots where all the Haitians and the Bulgarians and Eastern Europeans were sneaking through the woods. But don't you, uh, even though I'm very, you know, I look at that very critically, that whole, the way it was handled, but I think now, hasn't, it, hasn't the border, haven't they gotten a balance now where where a lot of people, the locals understand that this is the way it's got to be. But on the other hand, it seems like the officers who, the Border Patrol, the Cust- well, I guess Homeland Security, they, they've balanced it a bit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was an educational process because you had 9-11 and the general public said nothing's going to happen in this area. Right. You know, we're not a major target. And what they didn't realize, that with the unguarded entries and with so much remote area between the ports of entry, it it was just like a a sieve where people could just come in and never be noticed. So I I think it, uh, you know, was it it done right? Not quite. Was it effective? Yeah, it brought the realization up that it's a different world now. But I I think, you know, it's, it's hard for me... Um, to to know how an average person is being treated crossing the border uh, because I do have name recognition and and sometimes I think like when I go out to the border I say they let out a holler hey how you doing Scott they still take my uh, yep. they still take my uh, um, passport and that's uh, but they're super they even during the height of it they were super friendly to me and. But you know what? Sometimes you just don't know if that's the act. Because I would be hearing these horror stories from very respectable people. Yep. But I'm, I've been hearing pretty much pretty decent things now. Yeah, I mean, I go to Canada for meetings, and when I come back, 
even though there's name recognition, they'll make me pop my trunk and. Oh, I see. I've, yeah. The first thing they see in the back of my trunk is a is a big ballistic vest that says police right on it. So <laughs> usually it doesn't go beyond that. Right. Uh, I know I had a uh, friend who was born and raised. He said, "You want to get stopped at the border?" He said, "There seems to be certain nationalities." He said, "Even though this person was a doctor." Uh, he said, whenever they asked me, where were you, he, uh, where were you born? Yep. Bogota, Colombia. And uh, he said that was usually a uh, pretty much of a saying. A secondary. Yeah, kind of <laughs> with, uh, a little bit off the topic. I will tell you, when I was younger, I could do nothing right crossing that border. No matter what. I have never, I have never stolen anything. I've never had a speeding <laughs> ticket. But when I was a teenager... I couldn't get across that, but I wouldn't have smuggled a thing because I remember one time coming across the border, thought I was doing a favor. Uh, I always, I don't litter. I always carry my junk in my pocket. And uh, so when they're leading me in, I take everything out of my pockets yep. and throw it in the garbage. Wrong thing. <laughs> well, 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 uh, they, uh, they were, there was an officer in that garbage almost head first thinking I had just like dumped yep. a bunch of drugs but that's not so much drugs you'd be surprised that's called pocket trash <laughs> and you'll have people's cell phone numbers uh, uh, Google Maps we'd find these crunched up Google Maps on people showing how to get the Derby line and the uncharted or the unprotected uh, roads that go into Canada that's a it's a real valuable source of information lots of times okay, okay so now that we only have a you know a little bit left, is you've obviously loved your job. Um, retirement. You're you're only in your fifties, right? Yeah, just turned fifty-seven. Are you really retiring? No, I'm retiring from the Newport City Police Department. And where are you going to surface? Don't know yet. I've had several job offers, but. Uh, Retirement was a was a hard decision to come by. And last year, November, uh, my my son's in Montana, working border patrol, and I applied for a Montana deer license. So, I jumped in my rig, November fourth or something like that, and I started driving cross country, and I did a lot of thinking, and then I spent a week hunting with him, got a decent mule deer, traveled all around Montana. And then my wife flew out and joined me, and uh, actually she brought her mother too, and we toured around Montana, and then we stuck my mother-in-law on a plane, she flew back, and then Polly and I drove back a different route than I'd gone out. Mm. And uh, it was a three-week, first time I'd ever taken a three-week vacation. Mm. And uh, I said, well, am I ready to retire? And I thought back about Ray Carpenter there, and I said, yeah, I am from this job. Mm -hmm. uh you mentioned Montana. Uh, uh, I'd still be out there if I'd listened to my GPS. <laughs> because, you know, GPS, especially out in vast areas like that, um, if you listen to your GPS all the time... You're going to get lost. You're, you're, <laughs> and, and I tell you, I'd still be out there somewhere yeah. uh, in Montana if I'd listened to it. But, no, I understand what you're saying because, you know, so much of our lives are our work. And, but then you have to prioritize is we're not getting any younger. Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned it earlier, and uh, I probably got it from Anatol through the <laughs> Duquette genes here, but, you know, I'm getting arthritis, and yeah. it, uh, I've had one hip replacement, got another one scheduled, and, uh, you know, it's, that was one of the decisions, you know, it's a, it's a younger man's game now, you know, I'm... Oh not one to go wrestling with somebody on the on the ground unless I have to. But uh, it's it's been a big part of my life, and it'll be a change, but it's time, I think. You know, you must be really able to feel for the family of that police chief who was killed a few days ago in New Hampshire. He, he was killed eight days away from retirement. Yeah. It, uh, the first thing it did was it brought back a memory of... The chief that I replaced, mm -hmm. Dave Winslow. Oh yeah, yeah. He was involved in an incident with the samurai week, sword. With the samurai sword, a week before he retired, mm. and uh, 
there was there was an incident, domestic violence ish, incident on the Glen Road, and he went down there. And Dave was the kind of guy, you know, uh, kind of a bull in a china shop. <laughs> and he said, "I'm going to go in there and talk to the guy." And I said, "Not a good idea." <laughs> he says, "Why not?" I said, "Well, the guy's about my size. He's a weightlifter. And he's got a wicked temper." He says, "I'll be all set." I said, "Well." Let me and another guy go up around the, through the woods and come back to the back of the house. We'll, we'll cover. So he gave us time to get up there. and wasn't more than 30 seconds into it. There's a gunshot. Hmm. And I said, ah, son of a gun. So I go charging in the door, and just as I do, the guy that lived there is kind of backpedaling, and uh, I guess Winslow pushed him off balance. And I tackled the guy, and we rolled around, and we ended up getting him cuffed up and I look over and there's Winslow just bleeding all over the place and I said where'd he shoot you where'd he shoot you he said he didn't (laughs) he hit me with that samurai sword saying I wonder if a pig bleeds (laughs) so uh, we ended up charging the guy with attempted murder and uh, it was kind of nerve wracking after the fact because where he shot was out through the cellar door into the garage and if the bullet hadn't hit a wheelbarrow that was parked there and ricocheted up into the rafters, it would have come right out through the wall now where which, I was standing. Which one shot? The officer? The bad guy. Okay. Rotano. Right. Um, you know, very oftentimes, the officers who get recognized are the ones who actually shoot a person. But you don't, you know, I, I've noticed one thing is, like, in a case like that, you probably had every, re- you know, he probably could have easily have been shot. Yep. Um, but I often find that uh, people like John Vinan, who I believe probably in his own way saved many lives, whether suicidal or whether homicidal, is do you think, do you think those acts are recognized enough? Not unless you have leadership that recognizes it Hmm. but as far as getting the name splashed in the paper or you know a plaque hanging up on the wall of fame or whatever you know no because you know i think of one it only happened like two or three years ago and i i meant to do something and i really wished i had is uh i believe it was captain buck of the state police Mm -hmm. uh he did something that I thought he should have been given such an award for. And I, I asked him, I said, Did I, do you ever get recognized? He says, no. Nah. Uh, just a little thing. He used to drive through Irisburg, and he noticed this old fella sitting outside all the time, and the roof was collapsing on his house. Oh. It was an old World War II veteran, and everybody knew it was collapsing, but we all, you know, I don't think... Nobody did it maliciously allow it to end up like that, but they didn't think about yep. it. Well, Captain Buck, who was fa- you know, fairly new to the area, looked at it a bit differently, and he got the ball rolling. He stopped, talked to him, realized that he had some issues of his own, and he got the ball rolling to where the town and some of the town residents yep. got together, fixed, put, up. fixed up his entire yep. house. And, you know, to me, that was like... Yeah, that isn't what he's paid to do, yep. but that's, you know, I was... Well, it's, it's a well-known uh, fact among cops. If you're looking for, for glory or praise, you're in the wrong business mm-hmm. because 99% of the time you're dealing with persons that are being traumatized or they're at their worst, mm-hmm. and, you know, you're not going uh, to get a lot of recognition. And, and you see things like, like I, when I worked for the Chronicle all those years ago, I used to go through the police reports just when I did the, the court news. And what people see in the newspapers is typically the sanitized versions. Like, it must, how do you cope with the fact of what people can do to their own kids? That's probably the toughest case I think I ever did uh, was a kid case. I was, I think I was the detective, and uh, there was a husband and wife that were molesting their three young daughters, Mm -hmm. and of course they they wouldn't say anything when I interviewed them, and the hardest part of the investigation was done by the oldest daughter. 
the worst victim was the middle child, and the oldest daughter, who was only like six, put her arm around that little girl and convinced her to tell me what had happened. Hmm. And they ended up going away for like 20 years each. Did, now, now, I know you can't do this in a civilized society. Didn't you ever think, geez, don't you wish they would just attack me or something and then <laughs> <laughs> and, and take care of them your own way? Oh, the, I won't say that the thought didn't cross my <laughs> mind, but I mean, lots of times <laughs> back in the old days, a lot of people got charged with disorderly conduct. Hmm. And that's kind of, you know, they were, we were sick of dealing with them. Mm. So you'd basically get right nose to nose with them. And after a while, you know, everybody gets kind of ticked off and they'll take a poke at you. Mm. So that was, you know, disorderly conduct was kind of a catch-all. It, it kind of got that person out of your hair for the mm. night. Okay, we only have about four more minutes left. Is, and you probably can't answer this question. So who's going to be the new police chief? The best candidate that we can find for it. And uh, have, have they narrowed it down? Yeah, we, uh, I think we got 68 applications. And uh, the only th- we only advertised it in one local paper, but we put it on the city website and on the International Association Chiefs of Police website. Mm-hmm. We got 68 applicants from across the country. I whittled it down to 10. Mm-hmm. And then we have a selection committee of a couple aldermen, the city manager and myself, and we narrowed it down to three finalists. So you're, so, so you're at playing an active role? Because I know some, in some organizations, the outgoing person plays no role, yeah. but you, you're playing an active role? I requested and was going to be asked if you know, I could uh, participate in the process. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm kind of glad, I think. Depends how the next person does, but uh, we've got three good candidates that we're going to be interviewing at the beginning of May. And uh, we'll go from there. Right. Um, what do you think, it, what in this day and age, and in the city of Newport, what would make a good police chief? Somebody that takes a breath and listens or thinks before jumping into something. Mm-hmm. You, you have to listen to what people say. You have to to think about step one, step two, step three, and not go jumping into something. If, right. if this job has taught me anything, it's patience. Right. Yeah, because I remember you told me point blank. Because one thing I'll commend you is, you're honest, is when you started being an officer, at one point you told me you had a chip on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that's true? Yeah, I, I didn't have a lot of patience. And, you know, you've mentioned John Vining a couple of times. I was on his shift at times, and I'd get sick of listening to John trying to talk the person out of it and kind of just push John <laughs> aside and jump in there and arrest the person. So do you, you know, because I, I really do admire John, the way he handled some situations. And I'm sure in other situations he weren't good. Do you see now a little bit of John in you? Because some of, some I've, of known you, I've known you for years, and I can see a, you went from a hot, I remember when you used to, uh, when I was in, I think, junior high or high school, and you were just a few years older and you were harassed. <laughs> of course, we didn't do anything wrong, of course. <laughs> but the thing is, you've come a long ways. You've matured into the job. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got you to gotta kind of go with the flow, you right. know, uh, the whole playing field changes. Right. You know, it started out, I was a foot cop, and I dealt with people on the street. Yeah. And then I got a taste of uh, the undercover world and drugs and all that. Not literally, of course. <laughs> but uh, And then, we, then you go into, you know, dealing with big crimes. We had, you know, time frames where we had a lot of bank robberies and stuff like that. And now we're dealing with 9-11. And now you're post-9-11 where people are kind of getting lackadaisical again. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you gotta, you got to adjust, and that's, that's the whole name of the game of, of being a police leader nowadays. You have to adjust to the circumstances. Okay, one last question. It, it probably isn't that serious of a question, but I hear, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about downtown Newport. They want to revitalize and so on and so forth, but then people talk about those people who hang out on Main Street and how people are afraid of them. You know what is... 
I'm not, you know, I still remember back when I was a kid, we hung out on Main Street. And you know what? None of those people scare me. I, I think, you know, I do I agree with all their lifestyles? No, but are we really that different on Main Street? There, there's a, a perception problem. I mean, some of them look like I did when I was right. in the drug unit. You know, they're loud, mm-hmm. they're boisterous, they got a big beard, long hair, they don't work, they drink at, yeah. you know, 10 o'clock in the morning and all, all through the day. And I don't think you personally have anything to fear from them. To us, they're more of a nuisance because they do get loud and boisterous and a little disruptive sometimes. Mm-hmm. Is it good for the city to have them sitting there? No, because, you know, we hang our head on tourism. Okay, you have about a minute left. What would you like to tell the viewers about you, your job, or? Well, it's it's been a very, I don't know if rewarding is the word, but it's been a very, uh, a lot of things, I've seen a lot of things happen that I never thought would happen in Newport, Vermont, or in, or in the state of Vermont. And uh, it's been real eye-opening. It's been a heck of a ride. Uh, you know, just so many changes over time between technology, the types of crime, the types of people you're dealing with. And, it, you know, it's been very interesting. But I think you mentioned it earlier. I, you know, I think I've built a pretty good department in Newport. And uh, it's always good to go out at the top of your game. And uh, even though she wasn't paid by the city, I suspect your wife, Polly, uh, was a uh, big supporter of you and everything that took place. Yep, yep. Family was very good. I mean, they always, of course, my son was happy. I brought home all these different toys, you know, different guns or M16s or video equipment or stuff like that. So he had lots of things to play with that other kids didn't. You're not going to tell me uh, you, you let uh, your son taser his sister, are you? No, but my son was tasered. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I guess that's about it. I just want to thank you for coming on. But I also want to thank you uh, for your service because, as I said, I've seen you throughout 30-something years go from this hot shot (laughs) officer out to to, uh, battle the world to this seasoned, uh, well-respected uh, officer who is well known throughout the state, and when I served in the state house, you were there as well. So, thank you. All right, and thank you to the viewers for tuning in. Mm-hmm.